All right, everyone, um, if folks could take their seats. Talking to you, Chair Jones. <laughs> Can everyone, uh, if everyone grabs a seat, we're gonna get started with um, our penultimate panel for today on black study. Um, our, one of our panelists is making their way from the section that they're teaching <laughs> across campus. Uh, so Edward um, Martin will be joining us shortly, um, but I'm gonna hand it over to our moderator for this panel, Michael J. Myers II. All right, salam alaikum, peace. My name is Michael, uh, and I'm happy to be here. Um, as Dr. Raver said, Edward will be coming late, so we're just gonna get into it. I'll start with Darius, because I know Darius first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, y'all. Uh, it is really good to be here. Uh, Y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's really good to be here. No. Can you, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, hey, y'all. It is really good to be here. Um, I very recently just got back from, from traveling and have been in a lot of places over the last two months and feeling very scattered. And this has been a really um, welcoming and warm place to reground myself um, on my return. So thank you. Um, like Michael said, my name is Darius um, and I'm a PhD candidate um, in an interdisciplinary program uh, called Critical Studies of Race, Class and Gender in the Graduate School of Education. Uh, and broadly, I study um, the production and circulation of black radical thought um, throughout the African diaspora, um, specifically in the Portuguese speaking world. Um, so I was able to use my, um, my summer grant to begin my uh, uh, archival research for my dissertation project, which is uh, tentatively titled, We on the Other Side, um, black internationalism in the Lusophone world from the 1950s to the 1980s, in which um, I attempt to do at least two things. Um, the first one is um, to sort of map out and understand the relationships forged between activists of the Brazilian black movement, um, the movement for the social and political movement for black lives in Brazil and um, anti-colonial revolutionaries of Portuguese-speaking Africa, so primarily Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. Um, and so uh, that, that's the first track of sort of thinking about those relationships. And the second one is thinking about um, how those relationships, um, uh, how those relationships produced um, or contributed to the production of certain kinds of ideas around what blackness and liberation looked like in those respective movements. Um, sorry, I said two, there's three things. The third thing is actually thinking about uh, the conditions of possibility necessary for those relationships to be forged. Um, and so uh, that's a lot of sort of broad information. Um, I'll be happy to say a little bit more about that uh, in a little bit, but that's generally the, the, the dissertation project. Um, this summer, I started my research um, in Brazil. I spent two months visiting several uh, archives um, in four different cities, um, Sao Paulo, Sao Carlos, which is a city in the interior of Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and Salvador de Bahia, where I um, began to look for uh, uh, exchange correspondence or archived correspondences um, at organizational documents, um, at uh, um, sort of personal writings, uh, early manuscripts, anything that I could find that began to help trace uh, the, um, the movement of people and ideas across the Atlantic and the Lusophone world. Um, I think, so this panel is on black study and um, I definitely have a few things I wanna say about that. I will say, I think most of my time has been spent these last couple of months thinking methodologically. I've been, I was really vibing with the Black Archives panel earlier um, and several of the other ones. Um, because something that I just can't seem to stop thinking about even now, right, as I'm up here, I was gonna say something else and this is where my mind wants to go is, um, uh, I knew it would be difficult to find, right? Um, so for example, um, 
uh, the Brazilian government um, in an attempt to develop its uh, in an attempt to develop its its um, economic and political power uh, intervened in uh, their support of um, sort of the the Portuguese um, the Portuguese African countries revolutionary um, wars by um, at, at least initially um, these sort of like soft um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. Let me look at my notes. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, okay, let me take a step back. So basically what I wanted to say is that um, I knew it would be difficult to find the archived um, existence of these black folks traveling through the Atlantic. Uh, and so what I've been sitting with lately is um, the sort of like feeling of archival desire and the disappointment of not finding exactly what I was hoping to find. And how do I understand why, you know, some of the reasons uh, that wasn't able to, uh, why I wasn't able to find what I was hoping to find. Um, and then the uh, two things I wanna say about black study are, um, one, I've been thinking a lot about um, when Fred Moten talks about study, he talks about it as something you do with other people. And uh, um, for me, that means understanding the types of um, like sociality and relationality um, within black life that produces certain kinds of um, ideas. And so uh, for me, this is inherently a project about black study, but then also thinking about uh, one of the key sort of um, what I'm thinking about is like an infrastructure for the possibilities of these black radical exchanges is, um, is edu formal um, educational uh, institutions, projects, and programs. Um, and so um, seeing how black folks are able to, for example, use um, you know, Brazilian government, African, um, Portuguese speaking Africans were able to use um, Brazilian, the Brazilian government's um, African student scholarship programs to come to Brazil to forge connections, um, right, um, under the guise of doing um, uh, formal, you know, educational study, but to actually be able to connect and collaborate with them in ways that allowed them to, um, you know, develop support for uh, support for their movements uh, within Brazil to be able to uh, transfer. Um, uh, certain material resources back to Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau, um, and to, uh, yeah, I'll say that. Um, uh, the last thing I'll say um, is that uh, not only did this grant allow me the ability to um, enter uh, and access these archives for the first time, but also to develop, um, in ways that I didn't even expect, develop connections with many people um, in real time who not only had relationships to these movements, but um, had relationships um, throughout the, the Lucifon Atlantic world. And so in a lot of ways, I found myself um, trying to find the history um, of these black Lusa relationships while simultaneously being sort of placed in the middle and, and connected with folks in Portugal and um, Angola and trying to understand how these present day relationships are a continuation of that legacy. And so that's sort of where I am now in terms of thinking about that history and how I might be able to, um, to see it even when I can't find it um, explicitly marked in the archives. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, welcome, Edward. Uh, so Darius just uh, presented. We're going to go to Kavina, and then we'll come back to you. All right, Kavina, you're Thank you. Are you able to hear me? I just, I just want to acknowledge two things. Uh, first of all, it's bloody hot. Um, and I, know, I knew that we were going to, well, we were going to have the after-lunch crowd. So I brought a little bit of an incentive for folks to pay attention and if you do answer the question correctly at the end, you'll, you'll uh, earn something very special. 
but I want to, well, so this is a limited edition print of the short film that I, uh, I, I'm presenting today. So only 20 of these prints have been made. And it's, well, I was, it was going to be a surprise, mate, but th this is, it's basically an image of me uh, standing in front of the oldest baobab tree in northern Namibia. Um, but I want to I wanna also just start by acknowledging and echoing our elder um, Daphne Muse um, and just share what a joy it's been just to be here, um, to be here amongst black folks on Cal's campus. And you often forget how many shades of black exist on campus. So thank you for just you know, bringing that to light when you started speaking, I, I really felt that. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm Kavena. Um, I'm a second year MFA student in the art practice department. My project, which has been funded by the Black Studies Collaboratory, is a short film, short documentary film, titled Namibian. Let's try and multitask here. There we go. So as a documentarian with origins from Namibia, I'm really interested in entry points. Entry points that reveal caveats that have been swathed over by dominant narratives. The film uh, formed part of my thesis work, which was also an installation uh, uh, that incorporated objects that I collected from Namibia uh, exhibited recently at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. And it explores my individual history against the broader collective history of arguably the first genocide of the 20th century. Unbeknownst to many, the Herero Nama genocide in Southwest, German Southwest Africa, now Namibia, not only occurred roughly three decades prior to the Shoah or the genocide, the Holocaust in Europe, it was also committed by the same perpetrator, Germany. Using the Namibian flag uh, and the Ochikaiva, which is the traditional head wrap, as an entry point, I'm leaning into my ancestry as a descendant of the victims of the Hereronama genocide. So I engage with traditional textiles, the solid red and black of the Herero nation and the patch dotted fabrics of the Nama people, along with the yellow dotted pins representing the colors of the German flag, red, black, and yellow. See, then the work becomes tactile and allows the viewer to physically feel the labor, which is a reference to my ancestors that perished under the harsh conditions of the concentration camps of the Second Reich. I seek to connect, I seek to connect nodes of history that tell a story of both harsh physical labor and shared resilience amongst my people, despite the ongoing colonial and racial oppression. Most of you don't know this, but about a year ago, Germany apologized for the very first time, officially apologized for the very first time for the atrocities they committed in Southwest Africa. And I, as I talk about these continual colonial oppression, this continual colonial oppression, I, I also want to point to a recent example that really precipitated this work. Um, and there was a 
an incident in 2017 where the then US president met with a group of 17 different African leaders at the United Nations General Assembly. And standing under the flag of this particular country of Namibia, he invented seemingly a new word called Nambia as a reference to the country Namibia, standing under the flag of this country. This is again another example of how these racial hierarchies are per perpetuated. So I, I don't want to say I was really inspired because for the most part I was angry. I was pissed. I thought about different ways to represent that anger. And as an artist, I thought about the gesture of spelling out the country, the name of the country, Namibia, phonetically as not only a correction, but an act of defiance, a literal form of resistance. So with that said, and I want to be respectful of my colleagues' time, I'm going to show you a condensed version of the film which we screened at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Um, we did have a screening, a test screening, because I'm still developing the project. Film costs a lot of money. Uh, we shared a, a, a test screening at the Joyce Gordon Art Gallery on June 29th, but what I'm about to show you is just a condensed version. Uh, the original runtime of the film is 30 minutes, so this is only about five minutes. Does someone, does someone want to get the lights for me, please? I thank you. I don't know if you're able to hear that. It should be audio. I'm a direct descendant of the genocide. My family were here in Namibia. When the German came, what they did is to take their land. My uh, grandmother was married to, to this German guy, and my father's own father was also a German. I'm a third generation uh, descendant of the victims of the 1904-1908 of a Heteronama genocide. And we had this long night of kind of like catching up of the past whatever it was many years and um, at the end of that he um, that conversation led to him talking about um, Swakopmund and the fact that Swakopmund is in fact um, the site of a former German concentration camp. My great-grandmothers and my great-grandfathers survived uh, the genocide. In fact, some of them came out of the concentration camps. This year, Namibians are looking back over a century of one of the most inhuman and brutal colonialist periods in history. We are named after the beautiful Namib Desert, which uh, translates into shield. And this shield has guided us from early onset colonialism. We were one of the last African countries to be colonialized because of the desert from which derives the name Namibia. And I remember the moment we were driving in the car, he was taking me to the airport, and he said almost in passing um, that was the site of a genocide. And I I can't describe the feeling, but it took, it was like a hook in my lung to look at a friend and say, what do you mean? You know, most of our mothers was raped by these soldiers, mm. these German soldiers. That's where we came now from. And our fathers were just left with no father there to grow up with no fathers, a single mother in poverty, they did really harm to our communities. The social structure of our communities were broken down. My great-great-grandfather 
Kakungirwe Wakawanje was the first fighter to fire the first shots against the German occupation troops in Namibia. A hundred years ago, German colonialists invaded my country. And when the people revolted against the theft of their land, the Germans retaliated by wiping out 40,000 of the 60,000 of our Herero people and over 11,000 of our 20,000 Namas, men, women and children. The issue was for them to take the land. So what they have to do is to kill any human person walking on two feet. During colonialism, particularly during the period 1904-1908, our people lost their most valuable asset, and that is the land. The land that possesses so much, the land on which our cattle were grazing, the land that is so highly spiritually connected to our culture and our own existence. No wonder that a hundred years later, our population is only just over one million. Germany lost the First World War and with it its colonies, but this did not mean the end of our suffering. South Africa took over and turned the sacred trust of the international community into the brutal mandate that my country has become. South Africa managed Namibia like a fifth province. They basically marched in, annexed Namibia, and instead of managing Namibia like a sea mandate, handing over Namibia to the Namibians, they managed Namibia like a fifth province of South Africa. They introduced apartheid, and they introduced uh, the Bantustans, the homelands, and the same repressive and restrictive policies and politics that they did in South Africa with the black people in South Africa. So, so I, I just want to finally say thank you to the Black Studies Collaboratory because without the support I, I received from you all, I would not have been able to go to Namibia to document this work. So I just want to end by saying thank you all. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a quick question. I guess on the moderator I can do that. Uh, what is a C mandate? Please pardon my ignorance. Um, so the C, the C mandate um, was a policy that came out of the, the League of Nations, which is a precursor to the United Nations, which, which essentially um, mandated N South Africa control of Namibia on behalf of the British Empire. So that's, gotcha. that's essentially what it was. Gotcha. But, Thank you. But of course, South Africa, understanding the wealth of the country, uh, was more eager to control it for its own benefit. Thank you. Uh, Edward, hello, welcome. Thank you. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Sorry I was a bit late. I had a section to teach. Um, and as I'm learning, even if you try to leave early, students ask you questions after, and you can't just <laughs> run away from them. <laughs> um, so I think for, in terms of my research and my project, my project was more, um, so was more of an exploratory project to help me get to a research question. And I'd like to put the emphasis on the process uh, as opposed to the content, because I think that's the key thing that this, uh, the Black Studies Collaboratory opened that I couldn't necessarily, um, I couldn't always find uh, kind of in other sources of find funding. Um, so with this idea of how do you get to a research question, I submitted a proposal which was reflective of how I was trained before to kind of uh, express um, confidence and uh, you know that you know your knowledge and so my proposal said um, that I would go to Senegal and Ghana to study undocumented emigration and that to do that I would uh, connect with local NGOs uh, international organizations and if possible uh, government officials uh, I couldn't go to Ghana because there was a visa process I couldn't get through um, while I was in Senegal. Uh, so I ended up spending 50 days in Senegal. 
And in Senegal, the ways I came across migration, including uh, kind of how international organizations like the IOM were talking about it, is that it seemed, I cannot say from two months that that is the only way it, exper it is experienced, but it seemed in the way I was coming into contact with it that um, organizations like the IOM, so it was more kind of organizations like the IOM, French institutions like the French Institute that were interested in bringing the issue of undocumented immigration and giving that a lot of visibility then kind of conversations that emerged uh, from with the people that I was talking with um, while I was in Senegal. So I kind of stopped doing that and trying to meet NGO workers because that's not at all the point of my research um, and then shifted to a kind of more open, um, spending my time there to really meet and interact with people and understand what was on people's minds um, in the country. Um, I think that was also really important for me because I think my research and I think a lot of what Black Studies calls attention to is developing research questions that are responding to issues that people in the spaces where researching, in my case Senegal, care about first. Um, and sometimes in research it's easy to caught up in asking questions I think that other, other academics care about. but people may or may not um, understand slash that might not be the same first issue on their mind. Um, so in all of that, I think in how I was thinking through Black Study, I was particularly influenced by readings we'd covered in the class, also organized by the Black Studies Collaboratory, which I'd taken last year. Um, and that was especially an idea, um, this idea of how do you explore black life as opposed to black death. Um, I think along those lines, uh, Catherine McKittrick draws attention to the way that research can um, advertently or inadvertently contribute to black death by being concerned by uh, kind of getting knowledge from black bodies to represent it in conversations um, happening in university spaces um, or other spaces that are not necessarily those black spaces. And I think she draws attention to how can we kind of have a, more of a focus on black space and the space making practices of people within those spaces and leave from there not just to have an understanding of those spaces relevant to people living there, but also that through that work we can also understand ways we could reimagine our entire world. Um, that was one line of thought that was important for me. The other one was one from Moton and Harney. Um, who I think in, um, I think that they highlight, one key thing they highlight that was important for me was this distinction we draw between the university and the spaces it researches. Uh, and I think they're trying to undo that because that kind of represents me as a researcher, you know, that is going to know how to represent the knowledge that people in Senegal cannot do. Um, and that creates a dynamic that affects the research. And how do we move away from that and think of the ways that people are producing knowledge outside of universities and that the mission of the universities is carried out outside of the university and as well on the African continent that keeps on being often represented in these ways that don't allow for, for those kind of thoughts. Um, and I think um, one I'll mention quickly was just also the work by Kevin Kwashi drawing attention to how we can be in different ways in different spaces. Um, and I think for me it was really, when I got to Senegal, I experienced uh, in my interactions kind of similarities with, um, not to say that they're the same, but that there were certain similarities with some Moroccan customs. Um, and in particular, being in a way, um, Julian had mentioned earlier that it's impossible to research on organizers' time and impossible <laughs> to organize on research time. And um, I knew, and I think this kind of was confirmed by my time in Senegal, that coming was a kind of productivist logic of like, I'm here to do research as opposed to really opening a space for people to talk and kind of have conversations with me. Uh, but that coming was that kind of productivist logic would really be taken as something rude um, in Senegal. So kind of drawing on Kwashi um, was important for me to understand. I can be in this way that's polite here even though it's not always been legible in the university spaces I've been uh, outside, in some spaces here and, and in other universities too. 
Um, I'm just drawing attention to this because black studies was really important for me to be in Senegal in a way that was important for how I want to get to developing my research questions. Next, so I went through a series of kind of shifts uh, from moving away from migration, thinking about tourism, uh, that ended up largely being because people in the tourist sector could speak French, and I can speak French so I could talk to them and get into deeper conversations. But then I also moved away from that and onto fishing uh, and the fishing industry. Um, that posed a challenge in the, that most uh, people in that industry, um, uh, while uh, often relatively well off uh, in the community and so on, often don't speak French but only Wolof. Um, so I couldn't interact directly, but what happened is going so I was in Dakar in Saint Louis, and going up to Saint Louis, which is the city that my grandfather's from, um, I met with one of my uncles who decided to move back there, uh, and who really spent a lot of time in that city, and who knew that city really well, so I could get a lot of stories uh, from him. Um, in my time there, I started thinking um, beyond fishing, specifically of a community that's a neighborhood in Saint Louis called uh, Getendar which means, so Ndar is the Wolof way of saying Saint Louis, the, that city, and Get means ocean, and that's because they're on the, um, kind of on the ocean. Um, I, so I couldn't talk to people there uh, and get kind of that ethnographic experience. I plan to learn Wolof uh, next summer so I can do that as part of my longer term research. Um, so I kind of drew that more, yeah, through um, my uncle. But why I became interested in fishing and get ndar is because fishing, so fishing generally, fish are key to the Senegalese diet. According to my uncle, and I know it's not an empirically verifiable source of information, <laughs> but my uncle knows everything on this planet and no one can tell me any different. <laughs> um, but so according to him, um, the, the Senegalese, um, so actually, Fish as a proportion of diet in Senegal is one of the highest proportions in the world, and I think uh, just behind the Japanese, just to show the importance of that. Um, fishing is also considered um, or thought of as potentially a key industry for development, and that has all sorts of implications because fish starts getting exported, fishing techniques uh, start to be kind of arguments get made about the need to modernize uh, fishing uh, techniques and use kind of more industrial fishing techniques as opposed to traditional ones. And the international trade also means that some of the more nutritious fish start getting exported and the local diet needs to change um, and often becomes poorer in nutrition. That's one side of the story, but then Getendar is also another interesting side of the story in that it's a space. In the video, um, people had mentioned the importance of the connection to the land um, and kind of the spiritual and culture that that supported. And Getendar is the space that seems always under threat from development. Uh, oil was found nearby, and so there's this idea that we need to develop oil. The, it's a very, there was a very strong population growth in an area that's very small. Um, so it's one of the densest areas on the planet, and there's no building higher than two stories, um, to the point that people share beds. So it's always a very active kind of neighborhood. Um, it's also an area that's threatened by, um, by climate change, uh, by erosion, by the salinization of, um, of land. Um, and then uh, it's an area also that lives off of fishing. Almost everybody in Getendar is involved in the fishing industry. And from the articles I could get, there's even reports of people kind of refusing things we might consider development, like formal education, and wanting to make sure that their kids are formed to know how to fish. Uh, and there's all kinds of ways that it's tied into culture that I could talk about in more detail. Um, and then, um, yeah, it's really that identity that people don't want to leave getting down. It's everything about the identity of, um, that people have there. Um, so um, 
Uh, oh, and um, yeah, and one last thing is they're very famous in Senegal for being, so there's these boats called pirog, which are like relatively small boats that people use for fishing. Some are larger, and people of Ketenda are particularly famous for knowing how to build them and, and navigate them, and sometimes go as far as Angola on those boats to go uh, fish. Um, so there's this reality of this space um, that people continue to shape, um, and at the same time, this threat um, that is represented as overcrowded, unsanitary, um, in need of development, uh, people are represented as, you know, kind of lacking or, you know, not being poor when actually, according to my uncle, um, uh, you know, but actually fishermen are actually not the poorest. And if you walk by the fish market, it's a massive market using traditional fishing techniques um, for a lot of the national consumption um, of fish. So, so just to put that in context. Um, so I think I was thinking through getting Dar to come back to my research question. And I think at this point, uh, I'm starting the year trying to think uh, in this place, how does um, racial capitalism, or basically how do political, economic, and I mean, you could say also cultural dynamics, which form to produce the way that race um, exists in our contemporary moment. So how does racial capitalism inter interact with space-making processes, with the way that people in Getendar are continue to hold on to that space, to not move away, and to shape the way that it can be used, um, to shape how development can ultimately happen locally. Um, and through that, is there a way of also reimagining how development can happen uh, on the broader African continent um, and globally? Um, and I, I, I feel it's important because despite all the information we, all of the empirical evidence out there, there continues to be particular ways of seeing the African continent and particular ways of seeing development and what it can bring to, to the continent uh, and particular ways of seeing the importance of industries like oil and the importance of the economic over everything else. Uh, and I think the existence of Gettendach says another, um, says another story. Um, I think in closing, I just wanted to say how the Black Studies Collaboratory opened that is um, there was, well actually, and also my department provided a little bit of funding, so I need to be thankful to them as well. Um, but, um, <laughs> um, but I wanted to say, well, what this source of funding opened, I think, is I've experienced a lot of sources of funding outside of university and in university that are so focused on this productivist logic of like, what's this research thing that you're gonna present at the conference that you need to come in with a form of violence um, in talking to people and saying like, okay, I need this information from you. Like, I don't have time to spend three days learning about your family, you know? Um, and I think this research really opened the possibility and like kind of, and I really appreciate the trust that it gave um, me um, and it opened the possibility to go to Senegal and respectful of the way that people are there to kind of have deeper conversations, which brought me to this point. Thank you. Do I have time to get a question off or should I open up to the q and All right, uh, thank you, this is very rich. Um, and I mean that, um, each of you. And so I've been told I have a question that I can get off and then I'll open it up to Q and A. Oh, thank you. Uh, all right. So I'm thinking about uh, black method making, I'm thinking about Catherine McKittrick. And in each of your um, projects here, uh, whether it be method making and thinking about different entry points, whether it be uncles and relationships um, and processes and praxises. Um, but I'm particularly interested in thinking about this notion of scattering and scattered as like a praxis for black studies or black method making. And whether that be scattered as in histories, uh, scattered as in relationships, scattered as in like a materiality of being in terms of immigration, um, scattered as a site of studies scattered as like sight, like seeing, 
um, scattered as a temporality, um, as an, and kind of like as a way of knowing in terms of how it is that you're moving through the study of black life. Um, and so if, however, however scattered this question might be, if anyone wants to <laughs> <laughs> jump in. Also, also grammars as being scattered the, and defiant, the na, me, be, uh, I love that. Yeah, so I don't know if anyone wants to jump in. Sure, uh, yeah, thank you for that question, Michael. Um, scattered is definitely, I think, a good word to describe how I'm feeling coming back from, uh, coming back from Brazil, trying to make sense of um, where I was looking for um, historical information, where I was able to find it. Um, I think, um, I think uh, Rashad and I were having this, I don't know if he's still here, we were having this conversation um, a couple of days ago and he mentioned it earlier, thinking about being so grateful for uh, black feminist historians who have done the work of, um, of not only talking about uh, silences and erasures in the archives, but the sort of affect of, um, of encountering those erasures, of um, having this sort of deep uh, longing and desire to find, um, you know, quote unquote evidence of, of uh, this thing you know to be true, this thing that everyone around you seems to be talking about and knows to be true, but you can't uh, properly document it in some way, right? And um, I think scattered is a good way to describe how, um, you know, I, I would see just, you know, I, I'd find a few names on a list of, you know, these students came to Salvador uh, in 1961, right? But not be able to find any other information about them. Um, I'd be talking to someone in a park late at night about my research and uh, they would say, um, you know, we, we know uh, this organization um, was in contact with um, the PAIGC, the Revolutionary Party in uh, Guinea-Bissau, for example. Um, and I would ask, you know, do you, like, you know, where can I find that? And they would say, oh, I don't know, that's just something that people have told me, right? And so piecing together these scatterings of, um, of history uh, has, I, I think, scattered is a good way to describe sort of the way that I've been trying to make sense of um, my methodological practice this summer. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, just the very production of this project was a scattered endeavor. Um, and thinking about the time in which we were making this work, um, you know, the Omicron variant had just emerged. Um, and just thinking about traveling across the Atlantic was already something that was filled with, I mean, it filled me with anxiety because I understood that the probability of, of leaving the country was, was there, but it was coming back that would have been the issue. Um, and if you think about Namibia as a country, it's, it's massive. It's the size of the state of California, mm -hmm. although it's only inhabited by two and a half million people. Um, it's the exact so the probability of meeting a Namibian is quite, uh, it's quite low. But I, I, I was, <laughs> I was, I, I had to condense four weeks of production into two weeks because when they had opened it up, I had, I had, I had traveled over and driving to all four corners of the country with the amount of time that I had. Um, and also understanding that each aspect of that talking head interview would add to the narrative. Um, I, I, I felt like it, it, it ended up becoming more of a community effort. Um, I had to rely on family members and friends um, who had no film background, literally did workshops, and then the next day we went into the field. Um, and just thinking about the, the title Namibia itself, um, and, and as I said, it was, it was really thought of as a response um, you know, to, Trump, to Trump's inability to, you know, to say it. Um, I, I, I had to explain on the ground, when I was on the ground, to folks like why this project was important and, and, and why I was embarking on, on this project. Um, a, lot of, a lot of folks didn't even really understand how 
this would be translated across when I got, when I got back. Um, so yeah, there was a sense of, of just like scattering in, 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 in running around, making sure I got what I needed, um, but also just making sure that I'm using my positionality um, and, and allowing folks, just like you said, you're not just there to document and, and, and chip out, but al allowing folks to also buy into that process. I'm not sure if that answers your question. That's a oh, fairly absolutely. scattered response. Yeah. <laughs> Thank um, you. I think in terms of scattering, um, I was thinking through, so in Gettendar, I was also thinking through, Gettendar is a fishing community in Saint Louis in Northern Senegal. Dakar, which is now the capital, was previously um, had uh, fishing uh, communities called Lebu, who speak the same language, uh, Wolof, but they're, I don't know why they're called Lebu. Um, and my aunt, the wife of my uh, uncle, is from one of those villages. <laughs> And so she was telling me the story of Sumbidun, one of these villages that actually got scattered right after independence because they didn't have formal titles and the government kind of um, displaced a lot of the people. There's still a fishing village there um, or a fishing community there, but it's much more kind of scattered. And I think there could, there could be interesting research around that, but this notion of scattering, I think why that's important is that that's, like people of Gettendar also look to Sumbidun when the government tries to, or somebody tries to convince them that they should move somewhere else because the area is getting overpopulated. And so there's kind of like this thread of scattering and this thread of scattering that's coming from many different sources as well. It's not just national government, it's also kind of international investment. It's also the environment. It's also the result of climate change and rising waters. And so, and I guess, yeah, I guess with this idea of scattering, I'm thinking that Gettendar is interesting because how, how is it that a community that's also, always threatened by it continues to be able to evade it and to exist with such, um, such strong control, ongoing control on the piece of land um, that, that they have um, there. Thank you. Uh, and I think that attests to actually almost the entire history of blackness, the both and. <laughs> You're Yes. Who can spell Namibia? The proper spell. Okay. A -M -B -I -A. Got it okay. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> one at a time. Okay, we've got. Okay, hand up there. Hand, hand up there. Jackpot. That's it. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. Thank you all.